And we want to thank you to our chat with Coach. We want to thank Mark Grenda and Rachel O'Donnell with the Fuel for setting this up, and Coach Doug Christensen for joining us for this early October chat. Usually, it's about time we're thinking about training camp and getting the guys in town and getting ready for uh, the season. But uh, it's been an unusual off season, Coach. But uh, it's been a very productive one. Is uh, looking at the player signings and the players you've brought in. It looks like you've been uh, very hard at work bringing together what should be a really exciting hockey team for the upcoming season as we look to get started in December. Well, obviously, first and foremost, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can we can have a little bit of back and forth too. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to to jump in. Uh, Andrews uh, does is going to do as he always does. Uh, and, and, and we'll answer or ask all of your questions. I'll do my best to answer. But if there's something you have as a follow-up, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, and obviously, if you want to put uh, Mark or Rachel on the spot, uh, don't be afraid to do that either. Uh, they love that stuff. So, uh, But anyway, uh, thanks so much. It's, it, it's been a busy off-season. It's been a, uh, a crazy year, not just for me, but for everybody. Um, and so it's nice to be talking hockey again. It is nice to be talking hockey. If you have a question for Coach, Um, use the raise hand feature if you can. And that way, if I see your hand up, I'll call on you and just unmute your mic. You can ask coach your question. And then uh, again, if you've got a follow up or anything, we can uh, follow up with that. So, and you can always drop it in the chat too, if you feel more comfortable that way, as opposed to speaking. Absolutely. And so uh, use either one of those tools and uh, who would, who'd like to go first and uh, has a question for coach here in our, in our chat. I think we put it on Mark. Let's put it on Mark first. In-house question. Yeah. Make it eat, make it tough. Get the ball rolling. Put me on the spot. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Let's put you on the spot first. We'll ease everybody into it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, coach, uh, it's been an interesting off season for sure. And uh, you've been very busy signing players. Um, do you have any players that you're most excited about? Uh, I don't know who we've announced, um, entirely, uh, if if everybody that we've, we've signed has come out. Um, but, uh, I would say one of the players that I think our fans should look forward to seeing is, is David Broll. Obviously he's played in the national hockey league. Uh, he's, he's something we didn't have last year. Uh, he's, he's big, he's strong, he's physical, uh, he's been an ECHL all-star. Uh, so I look at him as a guy that can come in and, and, and play a considerable amount of minutes, uh, take up a leadership role, uh, but also can be a, a effective on the ice. And so I think that he's a guy that can be a fan favorite. I th- think we've got a lot of other guys uh, that can step up. I think obviously uh, we, we announced Willie Raskob this week, another former ECHL all-star. Uh, he's finished second in the league in scoring for defensemen. And so he's another guy that's got high end talent um, and can really, uh, you know, run a power play. Um, and we obviously have some guys uh, returning and hopefully some guys that will be announced in the near future uh, that can help us out uh, on the power play and in transition as well. I know last year you built a core and that was really a, a focus of last season. This offseason, it looks like a lot of the new guys you've brought in, you mentioned David Broll, size has been a uh, getting a bigger hockey team uh, seems to have been a focus. Is that something I know you were doing at the end of last season as well, but has been a focus as far as making your your team both big and physical, but also uh, mixing that in with the skill you have? Yeah, I think, you know, our team um... – at the beginning of last year, especially when we didn't have Wiz and, and Asipov was up, uh, we, we lacked physicality and we went out and we tried to, to, to get it um, in terms of size. And, you know, we added Matt Schmaltz in a trade uh, and we wound up moving him on to Kansas City. And that trade, along with Sam Kirker, uh, brought us, you know, two bigger, stronger uh, guys. And I thought that that helped our team. I thought that. Uh, we were stronger on the walls. We were stronger at the net fronts. And um, I thought that they paid dividends. And I th- also thought that our explosiveness uh, didn't go away because of it. And that was one of the things last year that if you were playing against us, you had to worry about us uh, being able to turn any play uh, into a scoring chance going the other way. And, and so for me, 
I wanted to add some size. I wanted to add some grit. We did that. Um, now we're going to be able to uh, not only play physical, uh, but also be able to skate and uh, be able to put teams under pressure in different ways. One of the questions in the chat was, how much do you use analytics in recruiting players and how much are advanced stats widely available at the ECHL level? Well, we actually have uh, DJ Williamson who does our analytics and uh, the analytics for us have been really helpful. I think that uh, in, in any given game, uh, analytics can be a bit skewed, but much like a batting average, a player can go four for four uh, behind the plate in baseball. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's a 1,000 hitter. It's what does he do for you consistently day after day, week after week, uh, month after month. And uh, so for me, uh, that's really what we've tried to do uh, is to use those analytics in terms of evaluating our own players, evaluating players on other teams. Um, and then in terms of recruiting, I would say we use it less uh, then we would just because of the sample sizes and you don't know exactly who you're getting it from and what those, uh, that information is going to be. Um, but we use it a lot, uh, and it's been a really helpful tool for us. How much as well, when it comes to doing a little bit of recruiting, how much do you rely on contacts, whether they be your contacts in Europe, where you've been able to sign a couple of players that have played overseas and, um, as well as those in college hockey and in juniors, you know, how much, how important is that network that you've developed through your years, both coaching in Europe and, co and being involved in the United States Hockey League, help in making contacts and bringing players to Indy? Tremendously. I mean, I think that um, one of the areas that I've been fortunate is I had the opportunity to be in different spots. And as a result of that, I got to meet a lot of people. Um, most specifically agents, because agents are the door that unlocks the players. And if you can't get through the door, you're not going to get to the players. And so I've been fortunate to be able to uh, identify the right players. I've been fortunate to be able to then use connections to be able to get them to come in. Um, and that's been really important. The other thing has been, uh, and, and it's evolved since I've become a coach, is the, the access to video. And so now with 10 clicks of a button, you can download every single goal a player has scored for the last five years, and it took you 90 seconds to do it. Um, and that gives you great visuals. Uh, it can give you statistical data on his face-offs. It can give you a better understanding of um, when, was, when was he on, his, on the ice. I mean, I remember I, I recruited a player, and I watched all of his goals, and he scored about five or six goals on the empty net. Um, and he's a 20 goal scorer, right? And so uh, when 25% of his goals are uh, on an empty net, you say, well, maybe he's not a goal scorer, but maybe he's really reliable. Uh, and his coach has him on the ice in the last minute of the game. So it might not be exactly what you were thinking. So those bits and pieces have been really helpful. So it's been connections, it's been video, uh, and then it's obviously really going through the agents and negotiating the right contract for everybody. A couple more questions from the chat. And if you have a question for coach, you can drop it in the chat or use the raise hand feature and uh, we'll allow you to, to ask your question to coach uh, directly. But uh, one from Reagan in the chat is, is there anything in particular you really try to look for when it comes to signing a player, any attributes you're, you're really looking to see? Uh, Reagan, it, it, it's a great question. Um, so a few things. For me, the first and most important thing is how are they as a person? And I think this year more than ever, uh, it, that's going to be the challenge. That is going to be the most important thing because if you can't trust players to be smart with their health, um, it's going to put really a lot of people in, in, in a tough spot. And so uh, – I've always done that. If you look at, if you go back through my teams, the majority of my players uh, have been captains somewhere else. Um, they've been in leadership positions. They're players of high character. And I really think that we had that last year. And I think that you saw that. You could feel that you had a team full of passionate players. Um, but then you need players to do a job. And you, know, and, and you want to have a team that has an identity. And, uh, you know, last year we are, we are deadly in transition, uh, offensively and defensively. And so we sought players who could skate. Well, we return a lot of those players. Um, and now we've tried to supplement that with 
a little bit uh, bigger team uh, so that when we do play teams in our division over and over and over again, um, that we can handle some of that physicality. And so uh, to answer your question, Reagan, uh, first and foremost, character. And then after that, it's really about having a skill set that can help us. And so for me last year, a lot of that was skill and speed. And this year we've added some of that grit and, and, and size as well. I'm going to throw it back to Mark for a question he had in the chat. I'll let you ask that one, Mark. I got to unmute my mic. I got a bunch <laughs> of people here in the office, Doug, all bothering me. No, uh, as, they should, as they should. <laughs> we got three play, three players announced so far that are uh, NHL draft picks. Does being drafted give you an advantage over a player who may have come straight from college or juniors? Obviously, being drafted gives you um, a, a foothold into the organization. So if you're undrafted, you don't have necessarily a foothold to go into any organization. Um, if you're drafted, that means somebody uh, put their reputation and hours uh, of scouting on the line to vouch for you uh, that you're going to be an asset to the organization. And so um, that to me, I think is, is, is huge. Um, and I think that that's uh, an opportunity for a player, but really at the end of the day, it comes down to what you do on the ice and there's undrafted players throughout the NHL. Uh, there's undrafted players throughout the American league, our league all over the world um, and are really good hockey players, but tra being drafted, obviously, uh, gives you a leg up. And then the other thing is, if we're being completely honest, uh, where were you drafted? Um, if you're a first round draft pick and uh, an organization gave you a million dollars plus, um, well, that's a lot of money and they want to make sure they have a return on their investment. And so uh, a player who's drafted higher, who might have uh, uh, more money invested in him might get more opportunities than a player who wasn't. Matt Shaw asks, what are your favorite hockey movies? I mean, it's hard not to include Slapshot. Uh, and obviously, I would say um, Youngblood. Those would be the two for sure. Youngblood, Youngblood and Slapshot were by far my two favorite hockey movies uh, uh, growing up. I, I was just past the Mighty Ducks, and uh, so I never really got into the Mighty Ducks. Uh, it was right just, just past my, my age group. I think Slapshot is that for just about anybody of our age, but have you experienced a lot of the life that, you know, Slapshot obviously captures the life of minor league hockey in the 1970s, but how much of Slapshot is something you've experienced and, you know, how much of it is maybe a little bit embellished, uh, at least by the time that you were playing in, uh, in minor pro uh, hockey? Yeah, I mean, obviously the resources in the league and, and the perception of the fighting is just totally different. Um, and, uh, you know, but the one thing that I would say is when you see a hockey locker room uh, and you see the banter going back and forth, it, it doesn't matter what room you're in. Uh, guys are giving each other a hard time all day, every day about anything and everything. And so... Um, you know, I think that the banter that you see, I'm not saying specifically, um, is, is exactly the way that it is. Um, but the mindset is just in terms of, uh, giving each other a hard time, obviously pranks, different things like that. Uh, but in terms of the league itself, in terms of the hockey itself, uh, it's totally different. And, you know, the one thing that, uh, I tell people is, you know, if you're in our level and you're moving up, um, most people don't have a job that you can double your salary in a day. Um, that's a real incentive. Um, and, and that makes people want to work and commit to something that they really enjoy and really love. And so um, I, I think you'd be surprised how hard our guys work, uh, how committed as athletes they are. Um, and, and so the, the, the slap shot that you see is not what it's like. Uh, that's not to say the guys never have a good time, uh, but it's not like what you see in the movies. Sydney asks if a player is really good at something, do you use them in practice or in the room as an example of what to do and what not to do? Kind of that real life example on the ice. 
Yes and no. Um, a lot of it has to, you have to know your players um, and you have to know your, your, your people. And so sometimes a, a player uh, needs that uh, confidence. And so showing him scoring a goal, showing him scoring a, uh, or making a great play uh, is something that they need to see and we show it. Um, but at the same token, what I really try to show is the guy who's blocking a shot. Uh, the guy who's taking a hit to make a play, the guy who's sacrificing in a different way, you know, like a Joe Sullivan, um, because it's not just the glorified, the, the guy who scored a goal already had 4,000 people stand up on their seat and tell him how great he is. Uh, the guy who blocked a shot, uh, he doesn't always get that. And it's a badge of honor that uh, he's walking out of the building with, a, with an ice bag on him and uh, acknowledging that. So I want to show those types of things. Um, and, no different than I show uh, a player having success, whether it's scoring a goal or making a high rate real play. Um, but I'm always cognizant that I want to show our players doing the right things. Uh, and especially when it's hard. And just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, either raise your hand, use the raise hand feature and I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you or you can drop it in the chat and I'll pass your question on to coach. Uh, the next one is from Matt Shaw. How big of an impact would playing without fans be? We saw that in the Stanley Cup playoffs, that they were playing the entire playoff in empty buildings, and I think we got used to it after a while. But as a coach, what kind of impact would that be on the ice uh, for, for your guys if, if that were to happen? I know we had one game right before the shutdown in Toledo, between Toledo and Cincinnati, where that did happen in the ECHL. I think it would have a big impact. Um, I mean, there are buildings in our league that don't draw well. Um, there are buildings where there isn't a, a, as big of an atmosphere as we have in Indy. Um, but I th players vibe off that energy. They love it. They feel the passion. Uh, you know, they go out for the starting lineups and it's uh, packed and it's, um, and people are uh, on their feet and you got the fireworks going. Like it's hard not to get energized. Um, and, and it's, if it's a teddy bear toss night or a Blackhawks night, you got uh, a packed house and you, it's hard not to get energized. The thing is, is um, that part will be missing, but the one part that will still be there is when push comes to shove, they play for each other and you need to make them play for each other. And I think, the NHL bubble was a really interesting thing. And what I mean by that is a lot of the teams that went out early were teams that had had success in the past. And they're like, ah, it's not as good as it used to be. And it was the teams that hadn't been there in the past that were striving and going. And they're like, we're all in this together. Um, were the ones who went deeper and deeper. And, and I think – that wasn't on accident. I think the Miami Heat being in the finals of the NBA isn't an accident when their their best player and their leader, Jimmy Buff, Jimmy Butler, says, I'm not taking uh, anybody to the bubble with me because they're allowed to bring wives or girlfriends uh, to the bubble. Uh, he says, I'm not bringing anybody with me because I'm here for a business trip. That's a mindset, uh, and that's not common. And so I think that that's tough, but I also think that uh, if, if we do have a situation where we have, don't have fans or limited capacity, um, we're going to stress that, that they're playing for each other. And we need to make sure that we put on the absolute best performance, whether we have 5,000 of building or five. Now, Dennis Williamson asks, who were some of your favorite players growing up? I like Derek Lindros. Uh, I mean, I'm six, five, uh, you know, and, I think Eric Lindros, had he played today, he would have been viewed totally different because, uh, you know, he had his concussions. And at the time that was viewed as uh, soft when he didn't play um, and, and said, I'm not feeling right and didn't play. Uh, I think that people would have a lot more respect for him now. Um, I really liked him. And, but I grew up watching the University of Wisconsin college hockey. And uh, I went to, you know, I saw Tony Granado and I saw uh, Chris Chelios and I saw, uh, Chris Joseph and I saw the whole uh, group that won the national championship in 1990. And uh, so I grew up, uh, grew up more uh, watching college hockey than I did the NHL. Um, but the one player that I always wanted to try to emulate was, was Eric Lindros. He was big, he was mean, he could score. 
uh, he just never obviously won a Stanley Cup. In Wisconsin, where the Admirals are the pro, the only pro right. team in the state, uh, how big is college hockey? Obviously, the Badgers. I've had the good fortune to attend a game or two at the Dane County Coliseum before they moved over to the Kohl Center. But what is that atmosphere like, and how much do the Badgers really captivate the state? How big is college hockey uh, in Wisconsin, where you're from? Well, it's obviously huge. Um, I mean, we drove an hour every Saturday night to go watch them as a season ticket holders. Um, and at the time, the University of Wisconsin football and basketball was was awful. Uh, they have a seventy five thousand. They had a seventy five thousand seat football team. They used to get thirty thousand people. I mean, it was and now it's packed every game. Um, you know, and they were they were awful. Uh, same with basketball. And the the big program at Wisconsin when I was growing up was hockey. Obviously, that's uh, their football program is now a national uh, powerhouse and same with their basketball program. And so um, that part's changed, uh, but it was what you wanted to do. And, and in the state like Wisconsin, I mean, obviously you look at Indiana, you've got, um, uh, you've got Notre Dame, you've got IU, you've got Purdue that all play in big power five. Now, obviously Notre Dame's in the ACC uh, schools. Um, well, in, in Wisconsin, you only have one. You've got the University of Wisconsin uh, and Marquette only really plays basketball. Um, and so that's it. And the whole state gravitates to the one school and to the one program. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, there's a lot of passion for it. And uh, Mark is uh, pointing out the uh, the 2017 Big Ten Championship and uh, Penn State winning it, which um, Mark's a Penn State guy, but we can kind of add to that the growth of college hockey, obviously Penn state coming, uh, coming in recently and becoming a national contender, Arizona state, who's coached by an Indianapolis native and uh, that they have essentially grown college hockey in the Southwest, the expanding opportunities for players to play at a high level, like at those two programs and elsewhere in college hockey, how good is that for, the quality of play in the ECHL because you have more players now having an opportunity to play college hockey. And therefore there's more opportunities to recruit players from, for the, the teams in our league. Well, we've tried to recruit players from both. Obviously the Blackhawks signed a player from Penn state. And so uh, not too far away um, in terms of of our, our organization um, tapping into those two schools. But I, I think it's important, but I also think that, What's also important is, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's programs uh, that are that are having a hard time. And obviously, if this season doesn't uh, come together in college hockey or it's reduced and the revenue that's generated in college hockey is down, um, it makes it tough. Um, and so I think all of us are hoping that the college hockey experience for the players, for the staff, for the fans um, gets back to normal as quickly as possible because, uh, it's fun to watch them, whether it's on the Big Ten Network or on CBS, um, it, because I, I, I love the passion having played college hockey. It was great. Um, and now it's uh, it's fun to see those guys matriculate into the professional level as well. I'm going to throw it to Mark for the next question. It's- A lot of people talk about how, like with all these college hockey teams and so many uh, minor pro teams, about how it kind of dilutes each league or, or, or whatnot. Do you agree with that, or do you think that the more the merrier? I don't think Rutgers should be in the Big Ten. (laughs) I don't think Maryland should be in the Big Ten. I don't think that makes it more the merrier. Um, That being said, uh, as it pertains to hockey, we we need to – grow the sport. And if you look at the growth of Wayne Goretzky playing for the LA Kings and what it did to change hockey, um, you know, a lot of people that I'm seeing on the call, like Michael and Reagan and, um, and all that, they are, they probably don't remember that there was no team in Dallas and no team in, in Tampa and no team in, uh, in Florida. And that was Wayne Gretzky. And so for me, that didn't dilute the sport, that grew the sport. Um, 
And so I think that hockey has done a really good job of growing the game. And as a result of that growth, you'd need more opportunities, whether that's Arizona State or Penn State. Um, that really helps. Or this year, Long Island University uh, coming in playing Division One college hockey as well. And so, so I think that that's very good um, because there are enough good players that you have really good players who are Division One college players not playing Division One because there's just not enough spots. So I think that that growth is very good. Um, and at our level, our level is the same as college hockey in the fact that the number of talented players has grown. Um, and as a result of it, there's more opportunities and the, the quality of hockey doesn't drop at all. I just to piggyback on that, I had a chance to talk to Colin Delia about a year ago and he's a Southern California native, of course, a goaltender for the Blackhawks. And he said, the place where I started skating was the Wayne Gretzky ice center. So that alone tells you the impact that he had yeah. on hockey in the Southwest. And even look at this year's Stanley cup final. A Dallas native scores a critical goal in Blake Coleman for the Tampa Bay Lightning to beat the Dallas Stars in Game Six, and, and right. I think that just shows you know the growth of the game uh, in North America, which is kind of awesome to see. But Dennis Williamson asks, how would you compare the ECHL game to the EIHL that uh, you coached in in Britain? You know, what are some similarities, similarities and differences I, between the two? I think the biggest differences are. Players in our league are on the front nine of their career mm. and the players in the UK are in the back nine of their career. And uh, that means that the players who you get uh, overseas are oftentimes a bit more polished. Uh, they're a bit more uh, stuck in their own ways. And I don't mean that in a bad way. They just understand what they need to do to get ready to play on a Friday and Saturday night. They don't need to be taught uh, this is what your routine should be. These are the things that you should be focusing on in video. They know what they need to do to be ready on a Friday and Saturday night. Uh, our level is the exact opposite. Um, we're job, our job here is to develop players to, to move on, to get them to the highest level they possibly can um, and help make their dreams come true. And so um, we're teaching them everything. And uh, this year is going to be an extra big challenge in that regard. Uh, but uh, that's to me the biggest difference. I, I think the speed over here is, is obviously uh, a cut above, but I think that has to do more so with the fact that, um, you know, the guys who are 20 years old, 22 years old, they're flying. And the guy who's 30, not 31, uh, he's got a few miles on his tires. And so he might be a bit savvier uh, with his speed, um, but he might not be uh, going like he did when he was 21, 22. Reagan McCoy asks, what's the best way for players to build chemistry with one another on the ice, especially now, since it might be a little bit more difficult for them to bond off of the ice since uh, you know, COVID has made it a little bit more difficult to spend time with each other? Well, I think everybody's going to be working through how to do that, right? Because um, in a non-COVID world, Reagan, you'd be uh, guys would go to dinner. They'd be going and hanging out. They'd go bowling. They'd go do whatever it is that they're going to do on uh, in their spare time. And now a lot of those activities are taken away. And you know we're still enjoying. I mean, it's a beautiful night, so I appreciate you guys jumping on uh, and being inside with us instead of being outside. Uh, you know, and their activities are going to be limited. Uh, I think what we're going to have to do as a staff is make coming to the rink fun. And when they're on the ice, it's going to have to be fun and they're going to have to enjoy it because some of the things that they'd be able to do um, in a normal year, they're just not going to be able to. And so uh, we're going to have to help them uh, be safe, be smart, but recognize that um, when they come to the rink, they're going to love it and that we're going to put them in an environment where they can enjoy it because um, otherwise they'll be stuck doing something else. And this is the best spot for them. How much does the team apartments, the fact that the guys pretty much live together at the fuel tank help in, in that? And obviously we've not experienced that yet because the players haven't reported, but how much will that help in team bonding? Because they, while being distanced, will essentially be living together. Yeah. I mean, we're really lucky. It's, it's, it's pretty much a bubble if we're being completely honest and if we can be smart uh, collectively and as individuals, um, 
we put our put our players in a position where they can um, stay healthy. And um, as we're learning, uh, this has not been an issue that's gone away. Um, and as we're entering the flu season, and as we're entering uh, where p- people can no longer really be outside as much as they are, and they're going to come inside. Uh, as a society, we're going to have uh, our challenges and we need to, as a hockey team, be as smart as we can. And having our own apartments, if we're being completely honest, allows us to control a lot of that. And um, I think that's important for us. I think that's really important for us. And uh, um, that's not only important for the players and their health, but I think it's good for uh, everybody associated with the team. How much has COVID changed the way that you look to build a team as far as the fact that the European leagues are already starting and we don't know uh, obviously the in the spring the junior leagues college uh, seasons kind of wrapped up a little earlier and the typical timeline for when players get signed to NHL or American Hockey League deals is a little bit off compared to what we're used to you know, how much has that changed the way you put the team together uh, a lot of different questions to unpack there. Your first question was, how much does COVID impact the players I sign? Um, it goes back to Regan's question, um, which was uh, Tim Shoops calling me right now. Hold on, I got to turn him down here. I should just tell him to jump on. That'd be, what do you think of that? Um, uh, the, the biggest point for me with COVID is, is we have to be able to trust our players. And so character is going to be the, the paramount, most important thing this year. Um, I, I joke, but I, I, if I have to trade a player to Rapid City for a dollar, that's what I'm going to do if somebody breaks the rules. Um, then you can live in South Dakota in the dead of winter for the rest of the year. Um, you know, I, it, Obviously, I'm joking, but I think it's really important uh, because if you can't trust your teammates to keep you healthy, they can't be on your team. Um, I, as it pertains to the rest of it, um, I think that uh, our team and the players and the type of style of play that we're going to have and all that, none of that's going to change. The biggest thing is just going to come down to being able to uh, know that we're all in this together. It's a different set of circumstances than any of us have ever dealt with before. We're going to take it seriously because we've learned the, what the alternative is. Um, and so let's move forward. Let's have a, a safe, smart hockey season. Let's have a great team and uh, let's win a lot of hockey games. Matt Shaw asks, how much do analytics play into your strategy against other teams and, and in your lineup choices? Sorry, you cut out there for a second. Can, can you ask that again, please? Uh, that's okay. How much do analytics play into your strategy against other teams as well as uh, play into your lineup choices? They play a lot into uh, how we pre-scout other teams. Uh, I'll give you just a basic example. Um, so what we do for an opponent is I watch every goal they scored and every goal they gave up in the last 10 games. And then I break down how they scored. Did they score at the net front? Did they score in transition? Did they score off an offensive zone play? All of that. Um, that information uh, allows us to say, okay, well, if they scored 70% of their goals in transition, it tells you as a team, okay, if we take care of the puck tonight and we're really smart, we're going to take away how they're scoring goals. Um, if they're a team that scores a lot of their goals at the net front, uh, one of the keys to the game is obviously going to be boxing out, taking away goaltender, uh, and not letting uh, them take away our, our goaltender's eyes. And so that little bit of information, and that's obviously not a full-fledged analytic in terms of you know face-off win assists and turnovers and takeaways and all the different things that that we chart um, uh, that that information helps a a, a lot Uh, as it pertains to lineup choices um, usually you're always down to one or two players um, who are going to be in or out you're not sitting there with a full-fledged overhaul Um, and so we'll use analytics to help inform that decision Um, But sometimes it might be as simple as one guy's taller than the other one and we want more size. One guy's faster than the other and we want more speed against a certain opponent. Like, for example, last year against Toledo, we'd want to be faster. Uh, Last year against Fort Wayne, we'd want to be bigger. So in that specific circumstance, lots of times the analytics would be thrown out the window. But if you had two players that were uh, playing uh, similar roles, similar uh, types of um, hockey, we would use the analytics to see who's playing best. 
I've had a couple of questions about returning players. I know a lot of signings have been announced, but you've got a nice core of players coming back. You mentioned Tim Shoup calling you. He's one of those, uh, Joe Sullivan, uh, Matthew Fogut's coming back. Both of your goaltenders are returning in uh, Charles Williams and Dan Bacala. How good is it to have a core of players that you're familiar with and who are also familiar with you, familiar with the rank, the city, and in the culture that is here? The only player that played the season before that was on an ECHL contract that finished the season with us last year is Alex Brooks. Mm-hmm. Um, when I took the job, uh, I knew that there were going to be a lot of changes. I didn't realize that we, it was going to be a complete rebuild, if I'm being completely honest. Um, and so I think coming back and the fans can visualize, you know what Joe Sullivan's going to bring every night. Uh, you know what Spencer Watson's going to do for you. You know what kind of goaltending you're going to get. Um, you know what Cliff Watson as a defenseman can bring. What um, uh, Darian Plouffe can bring. What Alex Router can bring. You know what these players can do. And so when you come into a camp, you're not evaluating Darian Plouffe. You want to make sure Darian Plouffe gets up to speed as quickly as possible so that he can be the best version of himself on game one. Um, that wasn't the case last year. Uh, yeah, we had a few players come from Manchester. Um, and so you have a little bit of an idea of who they were and what they did. Um, but the lion's share of the guys in camp, uh, we've never seen before camp. And uh, it'll be nice to not have to do that this year um, and to be able to focus on this is how we need to win game one um, and not worry about evaluating 20 players uh, like we did last year. Was that really what you were doing early in the season? Because the first month of the year, you were really just developing chemistry and had a lot of really tough losses. But then from Thanksgiving forward, you were among the best teams in the league. Yeah, I mean, we, I think uh, um, and Jay Jenkins, our hockey operations uh, analyst, uh, I th- our stats from Thanksgiving, was we were pretty much a first place team from Thanksgiving on actually right, right after uh, Thanksgiving on our road trip out there. We had a lot of heartbreaking losses. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons. We had a young team. Um, and we also had a couple uh, heart thumping wins too, uh, where we came back from behind um, to win games late. So, so that part was fun. Um, that growth, but I do think that for being honest, uh, that first, Six weeks of the season, although we lost a lot of games early, you might recall, you know, we lost Craig uh, Wisimirski for six weeks. Um, we lost Dar- uh, Dmitry Ospov uh, with a hand injury before getting called up. Um, you know, Ben Yowds had a baby and then got called up. Uh, all these things kind of happened all at once. And uh, those are guys that we really expected to be key guys for us, uh, especially on our back end. And uh, it took a little bit of time for us to get up to speed. Um, but once we did, we just kept getting better and better and better. And I would have really liked to see what we could have done in the playoffs. Uh, that obviously should have, could have, would have. Um, but I think that our slow start was contributed to the fact that we were really evaluating what we had on a daily basis. Dan asks, do you still expect to play a full season? And are we expecting to begin in early December? I know the league's about to come out with an announcement. Uh, we anticipate sometime in the next few days or weeks, but uh, is that something you're planning and preparing for? I'm planning on a full season until somebody tells me otherwise. Um, and so uh, we're going to do everything in our power to be as ready as humanly possible for whatever comes our way. Um, I think as you see uh, sports in general, um, it's going to be about adapting. And so uh, we're going to have to be better at adapting than our opponents uh, because as we've all learned, everything changes uh, day to day, week to week. And, um, but I do expect uh, to play a full 72. Of course, uh, you became a father this uh, off season. Uh, Dennis asks, how's the baby? How's your family? Baby's great. Dennis, I hope yours is the same. Um, it's been, it's been great. It's been really nice, um, you know, in terms of being able to be home uh, with the family. Uh, it's been tough because who do you see, where do you go? And, um, you know, everybody's got their own different concerns one way or the other about the coronavirus. And so 
that part's been tricky, uh, but being a dad's been the best thing ever. And, uh, you know, one of these days, uh, I'm looking forward to a road trip where I can sleep in a hotel and not have uh, interrupted sleep. Uh, although somehow I, I might have to pay for that, that answer, <laughs> but uh, um, it's the truth. <laughs> All of us who have had uh, young children are very, can, can empathize. So um, next question from Michael is, one and I'll kind of field this a little bit. Do you expect fans to be able to be at the games right now? The Colts have been able to play to limited capacity. The Indy 11 have been able to play to limited capacity, obviously at a much bigger venue at Lucas oil stadium, but uh, I'll kind of turn this to when you're playing in front of, we hope to have obviously as many fans as we can in the building, but uh, you mentioned feeding off the energy, even on a night where say some of the Wednesday night games where they, where the crowd's a little bit, uh, a little bit less than say a Saturday night where it's teddy bear toss and the place is packed, you know, even with that limited crowd, how much do the guys still feed off of the energy? Because the nice thing is the Coliseum can get really loud, no matter how many people are in the building. Yeah. I I was just going to say our building, um, has really good acoustics and I wish fans could stand on inside the glass and actually hear it because yeah, you're right. I mean, when you got 6,000 people in there and it's going nuts, uh, you can hardly hear yourself think, but um, even when you got 2,500 the people in the building, there's still an atmosphere. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, you, you shouldn't ignore that because uh, it helps the players. It is loud on the rink. It's not obviously as loud. I mean, um, but it's, it, it, it's special, it's fun. And, um, you know, what we have for fans and what capacity that is, um, you know, as you obviously see with, uh, with different sports in different States and, uh, obviously Indiana, there's fluctuations and, um, you know, going back to how I answered the question about I'll plan on the full 72 and I'll plan on, uh, crowds until people tell me otherwise. And, um, I'll make sure that I do my best to prepare a hockey team so that people do come. They have a great time. Brandon asks, is there any updates on the outdoor game in Toledo? And I'll piggyback off of that. Uh, how much of an honor is it to be given the opportunity to play and for your players to potentially get a chance to play outdoors, kind of a winter classic style environment? I think it'd be awesome. Uh, obviously there's hurdles to, to get through, to get there. Um, but I was looking forward to it. I've never been a part of an outdoor game and I'm sure our fans would have, uh, really enjoyed going there. And so hopefully that comes to, to fruition. Um, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of decisions being made across, uh, you know, different States and what different teams are doing in terms of outdoor events, indoor events. Um, but it was going to be fun. Uh, and so let's hope that that happens. Uh, um, you know, just in January or December 31st, and uh, we can kick off uh, a new year that I think we're all looking forward to maybe a little bit less complicated year, uh, in 2021. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to either raise your hand and, uh, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself or you can drop it in the chat and we'll pass it along to, to coach. And I know we've been announcing signings throughout the off season and, announced one yesterday in Willie Raskob and of course uh, one last week as well and uh, and I know we're slowly but surely announcing some more some more guys uh, as the year goes on as uh, Dan is asking if we can share a signing right now but uh, I'll leave that up to you and Mark to uh, you know as far as the timing of those but um, what do you like about this team that you've put together so far and are putting together uh, as we speak and get ready for training camp, hopefully in the next six or so weeks? The character is high. People will be able to see a passionate team who genuinely cares. Uh, this, the speed level, uh, our team speed is every bit as fast as we were last year. Um, and then I think that uh, the best signings often come late. Um, and I think some of our, our, our best signings are still to come. But the foundation of the nucleus that we have right now, um, especially the players that have been signed, uh, are 
um, outstanding. And I think that fans are going to be able to know what they're going to come and get. And I think that that's something as a hockey coach, you want people to know that team's going to show up. Uh, they might have a heartbreaking loss late, but that team's going to compete uh, for all three periods, uh, and they're going to be absolutely fantastic. They might have a heart, uh, um, a heart charging win too. And so, uh, for us as a team, I really like the foundation that we have. I like the character. I like SB. And with some of the additions, uh, like Patrick McGrath and David Broll, I think we have a different element than we had last year. Scott asks, after having spent a full season in the Central Division, what's the biggest difference between our division and the North Division you coached in in Manchester? Physicality. The North was only speed. Everything was speed. Everything was skill. Um, you know, to, and it is a direct point of comparison. We signed or traded for Kevin Dufour from Indy to add to our team speed um, in – in Manchester, uh, because of the teams, the, the speed of the division, uh, uh, the physicality is much bigger, uh, uh, much more prevalent in, in our division here. And I think that's, if I'm being completely honest, I think a big reason for that is the crowds, uh, because players are more willing to, um, they get a little more of their testosterone going, they get a little bit more emotional, a little more, more charged when you have a large crowd. Uh, than when you do in a smaller uh, with smaller crowds like we had in the north, and teams just just were built differently. And so I would say definitely the physicality uh, is the biggest difference between the north and the central. And uh, Roger asks, uh, do you teach the new guys the number one rule of indie hockey is to is to beat the team from the other end of I sixty nine up in Fort Wayne? I do. I don't even know what the name that city is called. <laughs> so. Um, as, as we look, um, y you made a lot of moves as the team, uh, as the season went on last season. And one thing that Nick Olchek and I often talked about is that you were able to improve your roster without necessarily trading from your core and could make your team better. Was there a player or two that was somebody you knew you were getting a good hockey player, but turned out to be a really pleasant surprise that, produced over and above maybe what you were expecting as the year went on last year? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, Alex Rauder, I knew what I was getting, uh, but I think he was a player that who really helped us. Um, but I think the one player, and I'm going to tell you guys the, 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 the whole story, uh, and because I, I would tell Vanny this, um, was so – we had, we had, uh, match malts came in and, and, uh, we had Sam Kirker and, uh, and, and both of them are obviously great players, really, really impactful forwards, um, and really good people. And so I, it wasn't something that we thought of, uh, took lightly to trade them to Kansas city, but, um, you know, I was really looking to add a defenseman to our core. Um, and so cliff was the, the centerpiece of the trade and, um, they had a power forward and we were looking to add a power forward in, in Ryan Van Strelen. And he hadn't been playing that, that much for him. Um, and when we, he played against us, he had one, he had one or two good games. He had a couple nights where he was just a bit quiet. Um, and I wasn't sure. I was like, I, is this the guy that we need? And, uh, the deal got done and he came in and he was outstanding. Uh, he was a way better hockey player than I thought that he was, um, but he would, he fit into our room uh, seamlessly. The guys loved him. Uh, he and I still talk in the summer, and we'll just you know uh, have a conversation and uh, bounce ideas back and forth. Um, and he was he would have been great for us in the playoffs. And um, so he was by far for me the player that we acquired last year. That you know you hate to call somebody a throw-in in the deal, but it was the last piece of the deal. And, uh, man, did we ever wind up with a real gem? Dan asks in your mind, what makes a captain? You know, last year you had a couple of pretty good wins and Matthew Thompson at the start of the year. And then uh, Wiz at the end of the season, and you've had a lot of guys on your roster that have worn a C or an A in college hockey, somewhere else in the pros and junior somewhere in their career, they've worn a letter on their, uh, on their sweater. What makes somebody a captain? Who asked that question? It was Dan who asked that question. All right, Dan. Um, Dan, 
If you can hear me and you want to open your mic, great. Have you ever been to a bonfire? Maybe? Okay. Uh, if you've ever been to a bonfire and there's the guy who either has the guitar or has the stories that everybody gravitates to, um, and you're all sitting outside, and to me, a captain has to have that quality, and then they have to add that level of discipline and work ethic because you're going to go through some tough times as a team. And so you're going to need a guy who can rally the troops for lack of a better phrase. Um, and at the same time, you need somebody who makes players want to play better and raises their element, their, their level of play. And uh, so for me, both Matt Thompson and Craig Wazimierski were outstanding, but we had a lot of guys last year who wore letters uh, throughout the year, whether it was Darian Plouffe or Cliff Watson or um, Joe Sullivan, um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you could have probably put a letter on uh, three quarters of the team last year, and it wouldn't have changed a beat because we had so many guys who brought that level of uh, perspective and had that level of commitment. Again, if you've got a question, we've got about 10 minutes left in our chat. If you've got a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you or drop it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll pass it along to coach. And so uh, as this kind of our hour closes, what maybe was your favorite thing about coming to Indy? I know you're a Midwest guy. You grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, lived in Chicago for a number of years uh, while you were working in the USHL, but you've been in England. You've been in, uh, you've been obviously in New Hampshire as well. What is the thing you've enjoyed most about your year in Indy so far? Honestly, for me, it's been the people. Um, everybody who I've come across. Um, I'm going to give you a really good example. I like the fact that people wave when they drive uh, in my neighborhood. Uh, I like the fact that people say hello to each other. I, I, I like that. Um, that to me, that's the way that life should be. Um, and that, that collective camaraderie and, and sense of community. Um, and you feel that here uh, throughout uh, Indianapolis and surrounding areas. And so for me, that part's been really, really, uh, it's very much like home for me. And, and I really enjoy that. And so I, I would say that's been my favorite part and obviously bringing a, a baby home, uh, our first child uh, to be a Hoosier and, and in the Midwest is a lot of fun. Although then they put the baby, uh, I think they're playing a joke on me. They put a Colts uh, logo on the swaddle, uh, which was not approved by dad. That should have been a Packer <laughs> one, but um, don't worry. I rectified that. Make Before sure no the green Packers. and gold blanket. Exactly, is. Brandon. Exactly. <laughs> so, and, they're and, they're, and they're coming to Indy. And they're coming to Indy, so we'll see who gets last, the last laugh. <laughs> you, you've got an impressive bookshelf behind you. Is there a favorite motivational book or a favorite type of book you enjoy enjoy reading? Uh, I'm reading three books right now. I wouldn't say I recommend any of them. Um, I really like World War II books. Uh you know, there, there's an element of that greatest generation that uh, it's really hard to comprehend and having lived in Europe and having gone to Normandy and having walked in Berlin and uh, been to concentration camps and uh, just seeing all of that and, and learning about how just regular human beings uh, change the world forever uh, is pretty amazing. And so I really enjoy that. Um, I'll have to, I, I really enjoy um, you know, different books about coaching, like Bruce Boudreaux's books, pretty funny. It's got some good stories in there. Uh, so that's good light reading, but, um, yeah, I try to mix her up and, and, and bounce into different books here and there. Scott asks, is there a favorite road building you or the players enjoyed playing in this season? Um, I really think Toledo and Kansas city have two fantastic buildings. They're kind of identical. Um, but when they're full and, and, and they do a nice job in terms of their presentation and the fans and all that stuff, those are just energetic, fun, modern buildings. 
Um, I love the character of our building um, and, and our game night in terms of the flames and the mascot and, and, and our entrance and, and the video that uh, Rachel and, and Mark put together obviously is, 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 is great. But for a road venue, um, I would, those are the two on, that I, you know, even on the bench, you get a little excited uh, wishing you could put on the skates again. Do you have a favorite part about road trips? Reagan asks. This year, it's going to be sleeping through the entire night um, without the baby waking me. But um, you know what? I, for for me, a couple things. Obviously, there's the team bonding element uh, where you come together uh, as a group. But I think I love uh, when you're in a hostile building and it's silent when you walk out. And uh, there's that us versus them collective mentality. And, uh, and then you go into the locker room and everyone's depressed all over the building and all the gear guys are hooting and hollering in the dressing room. Uh, there's that special, it's hard to, to, to explain what that feels like. Uh, but man, it feels good when you get it. Michael asks, uh, the Blackhawks announced today that they uh, were not going to re-sign Corey Crawford. And I'm going to add to this, his question is, how do you feel about that? But I'm going to add to this. The Hawks also mentioned Colin Delia and Kevin Lonkin and that they've got a lot of faith in those guys, both of whom have played here in Indy before you were the head coach here. But how big is this for this organization to be able to look at the parent club and say their goaltenders right now are both players who started here in Indianapolis and worked their way up through the organization to play in the United Center for the Hawks? Sure. So first of all, Corey Crawford, obviously a uh, tremendous professional, had another great playoff run this year, um, you know, helped uh, the team with some huge wins in the, in the playoffs. And so, um, and, and being from Milwaukee and having your closest NHL team be the Hawks and see them go from, you know, not being full to full every night and him being one of the cornerstones of that. I think uh, he's obviously that speaks for himself. I think Stan Bowman's press release, uh, echoed that. Um, but I also think that it's, it's a, sometimes get lost, uh, that our guys are here for a reason. Um, they're not here just to have a good time. They're trying to work their way towards the national hockey league. And when you have an organization, uh, put that level of faith in the most important position on the ice. Um, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, opportunity, but it's also a reflection of the coaches before, the people here before, uh, developing players and helping them grow and to develop, and the people in Rockford doing the same, um, and, and the athletes uh, continuing to work at their craft so that when the opportunity comes, which it appears it might, uh, they're ready, and they're able to step into those, uh, those situations and those opportunities, and so we want to be, the, be able to do that with the next group. And Brandon asks, uh, Will there be a different locker room MVP item for the post-game MVP? I know we've had uh, the, the fireman's hat and a few other things over the years. How much are those kind of rallying points for the guys? Pretty – well, we had the Indy race car helmet last year, and so uh, that was pretty good. Uh, I don't know what the guys come up with. Uh, whatever the players want to have, uh, as long as it's within reason, uh, I'm all for it. And so – uh, I, I, I care more about the fact that they pick a good win song, uh, and so that everybody can, uh, get into a good win song and that it's not something that you're uh, being like, what are these guys listening to? Um, so other than that, I, whether it's a helmet or whatever else, uh, as long as they're playing some music and having a good time, uh, it makes us all a heck of a lot happier. So what was the win song last year? And was it a good one? It rotated too much for my liking and it wasn't good enough. Uh, my team the year before really had it nailed down. The t- my team that won a championship overseas, overseas really had it nailed down. So uh, it might be one of those early meetings uh, that we're going to have to talk about the win song. So I'm happy for you guys to make suggestions. Um, you know, I, I like uh, music that have, has words, not just beats. Um, but, you know, I don't, I'm not that old. Uh, I can still get into a, to most of it. I'm really not that old. So we're, we'll work on that this year as a team. I think right, Michael. So, I I think the last question we've got uh, here is uh, picking backing off of a question from earlier. What makes a good leader? What makes a good role model as a hockey player? Uh, like Sandstorm, by the way. Um, uh, 
you know, role models aren't perfect. They're not perfect people. Uh, and I think role models are people who acknowledge that they're not perfect people. Um, but they're people who continually try to do the right thing and try to help other people along the way, uh, specifically teammates. And they do, and they lead from the front. Um, you know, for me as a coach, I don't ask people to do things that I'm not willing to do. And I think that, uh, it's important for leaders to, to have that quality. Um, it's important for them to understand that people are people. Um, and I know that that sometimes gets lost in professional sports uh, just with how cutthroat it is. Uh, but I think it matters uh, what a guy's girlfriend's name. I think it matters uh, um, where he's from and what he values. And so um, I think for leaders, and whether it's a coach or a captain or somebody in business or a teacher, um, it's, it's the same stuff. And it doesn't change. And, lead, and, and just because you're in a position of um, power or authority it doesn't make you better than anyone else. It just makes uh, the weight on top of your shoulders a little bit heavier. And uh, um, in understanding how to use that uh, to, to help everybody. Because when you do that, um, it will help you in the long run too. And we'll throw one more out there before we wrap up. And Matt Drayton asks if the league has decided when teams can start training camp. I know that has not been announced yet, but it'll probably be a couple of weeks before the start of the regular season. I'll kind of twist that to how much are you looking forward to the start of training camp whenever that will be? A ton for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I think it'll sign a little bit of normalcy. I think that, uh, the, the biggest thing that will be tricky is really making sure that the protocols and the things that we put in place uh, allow us to be as smart uh, and as efficient as we possibly can be as a group. And uh, um, at the same token, it's going to be fun to see, uh, you know, we're, we do Zoom calls with our players and uh, Cody Payne came on. I know he only played one game because we traded for him right before. And uh, he came on and he looked like he was a hostage. Uh, he hadn't cut his hair um, in, you know, three, four five months. Uh, he had a full beard. He didn't wear a tooth. I mean, you know, uh, it was one of those, uh, you know, blink twice if you're okay. Um, and so, you know, just seeing guys like that um, and, and getting to see and hear about their summers and how they spent the time and all that stuff uh, it, it is going to be great. And so, um, that part I'm really looking forward to seeing the people and getting back to work and, uh, starting a new, uh, chapter in, in, uh, the Indy Fuels history. Well, coach, we can't thank you enough for joining us. And I'll speak for all of our fans who are on the, on the call. Uh, thanks for answering our questions, but also just spending the last hour with us. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, thanks so much. Honestly, I know it's, it's beautiful night outside. So for those of you who haven't got outside, go get outside, go have some fun with your family and friends and uh, be safe. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in a rink. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today. And we will see you at the rink sooner rather than later. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrew. Take care, everybody. Have a great night.